deep in the, in the bowels of a residential sector of this Medina. And I'm uh, on a, uh, a walking tour. Otherwise, it would be impossible. I mean, come in here and reliably find my way out simply because they're just too many narrow alleyways some of them lighten some of them dark as if you're going under buildings which you are and too many twists and turns the guide refers to this place as the world's largest living labyrinth and who am I to argue with him? This entire Medina is segregated not according to financial status or wealth, but according to trade or guild. Moved into a quarter that's very special here because it contains the tomb of the founder of Fez. That founder. Idris II is entombed here in this mosque, considered the most sacred site in Morocco's oldest city. That's the tomb in the corner of the prayer hall. People who live in this quarter consider themselves privileged. People entering the quarter, if you're Muslim, automatically bow just as they pass through the small gate that leads into it as a sign of respect for the founding king. I've just emerged into a lovely little plaza known for its most important building, the Inn of the Carpenters. This plaza was the original carpenter's souk in the Medina and dates to the 1200s. And guess what? It still functions as such. The alleyways leading off from it are filled with small carpentry shops, most notably these days, coffin makers. That coffin you just saw is like most burial coffins here, made of cedar wood, but of course since it's against Islamic law to cremate, everyone is buried. The cedar wood used for coffins here is of the lowest quality, intentionally, out of the belief and assumption that there's no need spending money unnecessarily on the dead. What I've come here to see is the lovely historic building you see here, the Inn of the Carpenters, now a museum. This is a centuries-old caravanserai, a traditional inn not unlike those that for centuries served travelers on trade routes across North Africa, the Middle East, and Central Asia along the Silk Road. There's said to be a great view of the Medina from the top. So let's go check it out. Well, I'm on the rooftop. As you might imagine, no photography is allowed inside the museum. But uh, I was told, come up to the rooftop. There's a fantastic view. And when I, when I got up here, it turns out that the walls are about nearly six feet tall. So you can't really see off the rooftop. But uh, a young man in the tea shop on the rooftop was most kind. He took a cushion off a wooden chair and said I could stand on that chair. So what you're seeing when you look out across from where I was standing a moment ago is me standing on that wooden chair, taking a look at the Medina and beyond. I'm now gonna move over and see what I can, what I can see out of the small openings at the top here. They narrow to just about three inches, maybe four on the outside edge. The views from up here are splendid.
I'm here at the Chihuahua Tannery, the largest of Fez's three famous and historic tanneries where leather is processed. This and another uh, tannery nearby are said to have operated here since shortly after Fez's founding 1,200 years ago. That alone, not to mention that the work done at these tanneries is manual labor, the same as it's been done for centuries, makes this place something that no visitor should miss. If you're wondering what the man beside me is sniffing, it's an herb handed to everyone to mitigate against the tannery's odor. The smell is pretty atrocious. All the stone vats you see here are filled with different colored dyes and white liquids. The hides of cows, sheep, goats, and camels are dipped in the liquids to clean and soften the skin so that they can absorb the dyes. The process takes two or three days. When I say white liquids, I'm talking about ingredients that include cow urine, pigeon feces, quicklime, salt, and water. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the downside to all this. It's no secret that tanneries produce water runoff that's polluting and Fez's historic tanneries are no different. Since the 19th century, they've made extensive use of chromium to aid the tanning process. And of course, there are other organic wastes. Tannery workers face a variety of health issues, including elevated rates of cancer. In the early 2000s, a, a plan was suggested to clean up this tannery and the nearby Fez River and move it and the other tanneries in the city out of the city where the pollution could be better controlled. I don't have to tell you that the proposal didn't go anywhere and neither have these tanneries. The grand cluster of buildings you see here constitute the University of al Qarawiyan, considered by many to be the oldest institution of higher education in the world. The university is hidden away in the heart of the Medina and isn't routinely accessible to non-Muslims. I wouldn't be able to show it to you if not for the kindness of Abdul, a textile merchant who took me to the rooftop of his shop to let me get a glimpse of it. It was founded as a mosque in the year 857 and shortly thereafter began operating as a madrasa or school, evolving into one of the leading spiritual and educational centers of the Islamic Golden Age. Although Moroccans proudly proclaim it as the world's oldest university, uh, many scholars, while not dismissing al Qawiyan's significance, consider university as a concept of European origin, and that's why they hesitate to recognize it as having originated as a university. The distinction aside, al Qawiyan was incorporated into Morocco's modern university system in 1963. What makes this place, this university, so special to people from Morocco? Not just from Morocco, from Malaysia, from Indonesia, from England, and from Africa. A lot of people from uh, all the world they come here to study every subject. Not just study here one subject, a lot of subjects for mathematics, like uh, religion, languages, uh, medicine, a lot of things, yes. Non-Muslims are essentially restricted to one place in the Medina to get a ground-level view of the university's interior, a restriction I asked Abdul about. Here it's a different law, yes, not the same. In a Casablanca, you can enter inside. I don't know exactly <laughs> what, <laughs> what is meant. That. Your mileage may <laughs> vary. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> Like others in this part of the Medina, his life and livelihood is in textiles, a subject about which he has accumulated a lifetime's knowledge and passion. And this is what we call the shuttle. This is what we call it shuttle. Shuttle has bobin, a bobin has thread. The artisan here working by four fabrics, always cotton, like this. 
شيبول فيلفت and agave silk this is not silk of worm this is a vegetable silk here we use this for curtains but cover but spread sofa in mexico we use this for tequila in the united states we use it for sugar or medicine from this plant we call it in arabic sabar agave ah uh, yes agave look yeah When I first arrived in the Medina, I wasn't sure what to make of it. It felt like a jolt to the senses, a little confining, almost claustrophobic. But since being here, I've come to see it differently. As a close-knit, living organism, where families who've known each other for generations are bound together by tradition, religion, friendships, what seemed confining now seems comfortable, even cozy.